Amina Malik Hussain, and you're watching The Coffee Table. And today, we're talking about art. We do this a lot, I realize. But today is special because we're talking about miniature art and the importance that it has in the sort of art canon of this part of the world, where it's going, what's the future, all these wonderful, innovative things that artists and miniaturists are doing with the form, especially coming out of Pakistan. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome on set Hadia Zara, who is a miniaturist and teaches at the NCA, and Duma Jamal, who is a visual artist and in 2019 won the Imran Mir Art Prize. Hello. Hello. Welcome <laughs> to the show. Thank you. And also you, Noorma, from far away on Skype. <laughs> I'm delighted to have you guys on site. I always like talking to female practitioners of any form <laughs> because, you know. <laughs> so I want to sort of begin at the beginning, as it were, Hadia. And I think all of us know that miniature is a very ancient art form and it sort of originated in this sort of 16th century Mughal mm -hmm. courts. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of evolved since then. So can you give us a little history of the form? It actually comes a little further behind ah. the, or further before the Mughals. It's yeah. actually originated from Persia. Okay. And that's where the Mughals actually brought it mm. to the Indian subcontinent. What happened was when Humayun was exiled to Persia, he yes. brought two uh, miniature painters from Persia to the Indian subcontinent, mm. who were basically Mir Sayyid Ali and Khwaja Abdul Samad. Right. So these two were basically the initial, let's say, um, artists who introduced miniature painting to mm. the subcontinent. Mm. And, and Sorry mm. to interrupt, but so then that means that the sort of origins are Persian. Exactly. So are we still following the Persian tradition? Actually, there's Persian and then uh, Persian influence uh, kind of combined with a lot of the current, let's say, or the contemporary um, art forms of the Indian subcontinent. Okay. So there's uh, Buddhist influence, there's Jain influence, there's Hindu influence, there's, uh, which is why basically we have so many different schools of miniature paintings, uh, ranging from Kangra to uh, Bahari school, to, you know, Mughal to Hindu and to Jain, mm -hmm. etc. So there are a, a huge variety of schools, and which basically um, include influences from all sorts of um, art forms in areas that were actually uh, previously existing within those areas. Oh, so okay. art forms like, for example, Jain uh, miniature has a very different sort of stylization. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pahari miniatures have a different sort of stylization. Mm -hmm. So um, the Persian, let's say, uh, stylization kind of combined with the um, Indian art form. Mm -hmm. And it transformed into the Mughal art form and the Jain art form, the Pahari art form, etc. So there are a huge variety of uh, schools of miniature painting. Ooh, also. I didn't yeah. know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Tell me more, Professor. So, um, <laughs> where do you want me to continue from? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so uh, Humayun brought back two miniaturists exactly. to his court. Exactly. And he was like, hey, this is fascinating and this is a beautiful art form and I would like to see more of it. Yeah, so basically what happened was that the Mughals were the patrons of the miniature paintings and so um, they started working as court painters. Okay. So by court painters, it means that they started making portrait, portraits and, you know, court scenes, etc. And portraits of the kings and glorifying them, basically. Mm. So if you see all those old miniature paintings <laughs> yeah. of these Mughal kings, you, know, you see this. Rose yeah, and, and those profile. gold halos behind their heads, uh -huh. basically uh, kind of raising them to this prophetic sort of mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they're very glorified, etc. So they're yeah. kind of like presenting this image to the public also, how they're God sent uh, leaders to the, you ah. know, to the public. Okay, so, so sort of art yeah. was being used as a way to kind of popularize certain myths about... Yeah. Yeah, you, you see how um, when the Western Renaissance was going on in the West, mm -hmm. uh, the Renaissance yes. itself, right? The so Renaissance. That's the uh, Renaissance, exactly. <laughs> that's when the Eastern Renaissance was going on in the Mughal really? area. Really? Exactly. So there was like a parallel Renaissance exactly. happening exactly. here also? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So that's when miniature painting sort of evolved in this mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was introduced over here as initially as court, uh, as a court art form. And yeah. then it evolved into, you know, a documenting sort of art form also. So, um, like for example, if you see images of Christ, Yes. So you might, must have seen those halos behind yes, his head. Yes, absolutely. And then if you see, you know, sculptures of Buddha, yes. so you see those halos behind absolutely. his head also. Yeah. So likewise, yeah. the Indian, the Mughal kings also, they used to have mm. halos behind their heads also. Mm. So they're basically kind of representing themselves as God-sent uh, yeah. leaders or God-sent, you know, um, kings, etc. Mm. to the public. The kings just can't resist this divinity <laughs> thing, you know. Even in Europe, it was like, oh, I'm God's representative. Exactly, exactly, ago, exactly. You know, here I am. But, you know, that's veering into slightly dangerous territory. <laughs> That so, kind of uh, leads, you know, people to not object or to not raise any questions about right, the people right. also and kind of love them and worship them in mm -hmm. a way also. Mm -hmm. But so, I also find it really interesting that clearly um, the milieu, mm -hmm. the Mughal milieu at the time was one that was responding to this kind of imagery. Yeah. And, you know, one thinks of, and it's obviously a very st 
stylized and, and a mm -hmm. formal mm -hmm. sort of art form. But was it sort of also being publicly consumed then? If this was the kind of like the messaging that was not initially underlying, but art. eventually when uh, you know, for example, um, those two initial Persian painters trained various other painters. Mm. So they used to have a karkhana system. So a karkhana right. system was basically how they trained a lot of painters, yeah. a lot of artists, so to say from a very young age also. Um, so they would basically sit in the court and they would, for example, one artist would be trained to paint trees and one, oh. would, be painted, uh, one would be trained in calligraphy, one mm. would be trained in portraiture. Mm. So they were different artists who were specializing in different um, areas of the painting. Wow, so that's were, fascinating. Yeah. So the, the picture is sort of a composite of many yeah, parts yeah. and everybody so there are, kind of Exactly, there. so there are lots of paintings who have the same sort of portrait style. You know, and there are lots of paintings that have the same sort of trees or the same sort of, you know, um, architecture painting style, yeah. etc. So yeah. that's basically why, because they were the same artists who were painting only the architecture, only the portraits, only the oh, figures, etc. That's fascinating. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, uh, Noor, Noor Ma, um, you know, Karkhana means factory. <laughs> and literally, I like the idea of everybody sort of rabbiting away in this little miniaturist factory. So do you have a special area of interest? Are trees your forte? <laughs> Is that how, how were you trained at the National College of Art? in miniatures because I, I think that that program began in the 80s which is slightly late I suppose for such an ancient mm -hmm. art form but so many miniaturists in Pakistan have come out of the NCA's um, program including yourself so tell me a little bit about that experience. So basically uh, before what happens in NCA when you enter uh, when you enter the fine art department is that in second year you go through blocks Mm -hmm. which are basically you'll either spend two months in a particular major. We have four yeah. majors, which are yeah. sculpture, miniature, printmaking, and painting. Hmm. So, and accordingly, like, you know, if you do well in a particular major and they know your preference, they'll place you there. Oh, so okay. something strange kind of happened in my batch because our HOD at the time, Sir Bashir, was retiring. Oh. And he decided that kids can pick whichever major that they want. That's great. So my batch, yeah, so my batch had the largest number of miniature students, which is, it doesn't seem like a lot, but we were 23 kids, which is quite a lot. That is, and, and to sort of have so many people who are that interested in wanting to do miniature. Exactly. What, what do you think that is? The first step, hmm. um, I think it was like, for me personally, it's, I had a hang of the other majors, but mm. miniature I wasn't very good at. Yeah. And I decided that if I'm going to get an education, I might as well get it in something I know nothing about and pick something new. Quite right. And when I joined, the first term was pretty hard because like, you know, it's strict copy work, trying to pick up the technique mm -hmm. and you know, it's mm -hmm. like almost a pop pointillism. Like uh -huh. you have to and paint and you have your squirrel brush and you're like burnishing your sheets. And yeah, it's I want to know work. about that. Yeah. So uh, tell me about that. I'm so fascinated by this whole process of setting up for uh, making a, a piece of miniature art as well. And I think those are things that art students are not familiar with at all because a lot of us in schools don't have any of those practices. Exactly, you had just have this thing like, you know, before, uh, if you just look at a miniature painting from afar, you never think, at least I never thought at the time, that so much work goes behind it. Yeah. And I would, uh, like, you know, we would go and you, uh, they told us, for example, the first time they told us to draw something, yeah. we were told not to draw directly on the busly because obviously you, you might make errors. Mm. And even rubbing the busly, you might damage it. Oh. So then you trace that. And when we started jumping into colors, oh. if our teacher didn't like the colors we were using, they would make us, because the Wesley is a very sturdy paper. Right. And then uh, he would make us wash the whole painting off. <gasps> you can and just wash it? Dry, <laughs> You're blowing yeah, my mind. <laughs> to some extent. Mm. And then he'd tell, he'd tell us start from scratch. So I remember Good there was God. a kid in my class, he washed his painting three times because I kept saying, nahi rang kachi hai. Huh. Even if you're making red, you need to add at least seven different or like 12 different colors to make this particular red. Like, Good you know, it God. should be vibrant, it should mm. have life. And, <clears throat> and, and I, and I like understand that. you have to kind of up the color, but sort of tell me, exactly. I want, because I, I really love the idea of this, that Vasli is the paper that is used specifically for miniature. Uh, paintings mm -hmm. and tell tell me how you you have to make it it's not it's just not paper oh, you can yeah. just buy from the store 
we actually have uh, we had a little course uh, like we had two weeks where we had to basically make vaslis mm-hmm. but because it takes quite a lot out of you yeah. and because it's layer on layer and you put basically a chemical in the middle to make sure that it's like you know it becomes archival and that mm. like you know b- insects don't come and destroy yeah, over yeah, time yeah. or termites but, but or tell me what do you do cuz i'm really curious and like i'm just my mind going be like but what do you do like what is it made of do you have to sort of glue paper together what kind of paper like what's the process you get a high quality grade paper right and you basically place it down and you make it wet right and you right. tape it down on the floor yeah. and once i think it's uh, uh, it's uh, potassium nitrate i think uh, mm-hmm. could you confirm i completely forgot Hadi- because yeah. so hadia says the, copper sulfate <laughs> yeah sorry copper sulfate and you put that there and then you put another paper and throughout whenever you layering them basically you kind of have to massage the top because it's very like air bubbles form wow. almost immediately and you have to keep massaging the top layer and then put another one and keep massaging the top layer and you basically do this squatting on the floor and there's you have buckets of water you have buckets of glue you have your sheets and you're taping and once all of this is done mm. like i am we made i think a total of 7 each and wow. at least 5 were completely disastrous because oh. even if you think it's perfect by the end a little air bubble would form oh no so once that was done uh, we have um, someone at nca that actually supplies us all most miniature artists i don't want to say all of them but most of us we have that supplier at nca oh thank god and we get it from us <laughs> supply somebody else is, is doing whole gig. <laughs> that this is his whole gig Wow. Oh, that's incredible and I can't believe that basically like you said you just told me out of in my ear how they're like it's cotton. Uh, yeah. The paper is actually it's cotton and you sort of layer yeah, it. Yeah, it's 100% up. cotton. So the sort of mm-hmm. artistic process begins from literally scratch. Exactly, exactly. Not just with the paper making, the brush making, the pigment making also. Mm. Like a lot of people now were using process paint etc, but otherwise um initially the paints were made and out of natural pigment. Tell me the brush story because I really yeah. like the brush story. Like <laughs> yeah, so tell me everything. The brush is basically um it's supposed to have a very soft, a very fine tip. Yes. Um so we tend to use squirrel hair brush. So uh either squirrel hair brush or uh Persian kitten belly hair brush also so that Persian also works. Persian kitten yeah. belly hair. Yeah, belly hair also or otherwise near the ear also basically because they're very soft hair. So um So how do you how do you get a squirrel how do you get hair off a squirrel So basically what we do is we attract a squirrel with various okay. treats <laughs> <laughs> So it may be a walnut maybe a tomato it may be kitkat they like kitkat also They like kitkat So uh no, basically no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> So we just tempt them they come over yeah. and um then what we do is that we wear really thick uh, you know like hide sort of gloves mm. so that because if a squirrel cuts like if it bites you then yeah, you get rabies Yeah you can get rabies you can then. You get rabies yeah. from a squirrel? Yeah. So so that. you have to wear these really thick hides mm. uh, gloves etc. <laughs> so um so yeah so uh you tempt them and then you you know you hold them and you have to sort of hold them and cover their eyes a bit so that, you know they tend to get a little lazy and oh. and then what you do is you just take their tail and you you know kind of give them a haircut. So uh you give them a haircut kind of closer to their body not wow. uh, further down mm. because that's where they hit their tail on the ground also so um they you know split ends form so we don't <laughs> want split ended hair yeah of course, yes. we want the softest hair <laughs> so the younger the squirrel the softer the hair so uh-huh. that also and is so then you have to literally coax a squirrel yeah. put it in your hand yeah. give it a little stroke and then yeah. psh- cut off some hair yeah and and you know when you kind of wet the hair also mm. so if it, it forms a natural yes. brush sort of form uh, uh. so um and they're very gentle like you have to handle them very gently also the animals because otherwise if they get worried then you know they can sort of kind of Quite cut right. themselves so also so then when you have the hair and you sort of snip off just yeah. like a bit yeah. and then then you have to make your brush yourself yeah mm. <laughs> like how so we use um I'm assuming you're not taping it no actually what we do is we use um pigeon feathers also for this purpose you know how the pigeon yes. feather they have a little plasticky for root they do at yeah. the so we root yeah so we it's take that part of the feather and um we insert the squirrel hair into the um feather for root and uh, and then we just use a bamboo stick yeah. to you know kind of make yeah. the wand of the brush good god and so yeah that is <laughs> That is like that is some labor. We're going to take a very quick break whilst I recover <laughs> from the idea of this brush making and we will be back in just one second. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back to the show. I'm talking to miniaturist extraordinaire Hadia Zahra and Urma Jamal and they've been telling me all sorts of amazing stories about how even just to get started it, the labor of love is almost sort of 
immediate. And you obviously clearly have to be very committed to the task at hand. So Noorma, tell me, um, I understand that, okay, so obviously making, and then, uh, you know, Hathi has been telling me that you need to have a shell to smooth down the paper with, and then you kind of put your paint inside a shell also. And it really seems to me like the art form is so deeply rooted in tradition. And then it is being used by contemporary miniaturists such as yourself and Hadia to sort of take it in an entirely different direction. So how do you feel that an art form like miniature lends itself to that kind of innovation? I think it basically uh, depends on that particular artist and okay. what they choose to do with it. Mm. Because the way, for example, that I paint now, I don't only use Vasli, I yes. also use like artist paper. I use other brushes as well. Mm. The, when you're trying to finish a minute, though I still use the squirrel hairbrush, I just use it for line work. I don't do uh, pardakht at the end, which is like, you know, the little dots, the way that they finish off. I use large brush strokes like an oil painter would. Mm. And uh, a lot of like, you know, uh, at times people really like that, you know, you're taking a new spin on it or that it's different or it doesn't look very miniature-esque like mm, if I didn't mm. tell them I was a miniature artist they'd just think this is someone who just paints in gouache though I make my own pigments I go to Shalmi get my pigments and mix everything have my own like you know stash of paints and all of that but there's certain things that I've completely cancelled out it's either mm. that not using certain paper or even if I use Vasli I don't burnish anymore mm -hmm. and you know stuff like that the way that I wash or even mm. my imagery for that matter mm. And then there's certain people that encourage this sort of thing, but I've also had a lot of people tell me, I remember I had a show in Karachi once, and I, because now I also make sculptures. Yes. And I had made a few sculptures, and there was this elder gentleman, he came and he praised me and said, your work is amazing, and oh my God, you've done this, and I'm, you should be very proud of yourself. He later on found out that I graduated miniature. He actually came back, found me, and told me, what a shame you're losing this art form and like you know that you should just Aww. be doing miniature mm. doing and like you know and he meant it in a good way uh. but I just like you know there's nothing you can do and I was like yes yes of course I'm not going to like you know he said don't forget your roots oh, and don't become like one of these people that makes a stroke and says this is the painting like you know <laughs> You've been trained in the art forms of the Mughal, the Mughals and I'm just like, you know, you kind of just have to take it with a grain of salt yeah, because it yeah. depends. Like some people put, like really appreciate it and some mm. people generally think, what are you doing? You're wasting yeah. your talent or whatever is being taught to yeah, you. Yeah. And so, it's such yeah. a pity because a great deal of pressure to put on any artist that you are now the sort of conservator of our cultural legacy. Exactly. You know, like... No, I mean, yes, maybe a little bit, but I also want to make art and I want to sort of, you know, do it the way that I want to do it. And like, Hadi, how do you feel about that? Because, you know, one is not working in any kind of artistic vacuum now. Yes, so yes. Do you feel like your training in something so traditional has also helped you in sort of in different ways that sort of helped you interrogate the future, sort of the evolution of your artistic sensibility Actually, in a certain way. Definitely. Because the very strict discipline that um, involves that is involved in miniature painting is actually kind of giving uh, a lot of freedom to the artist in a very different sort of way. Mm -hmm. Because um, miniature painting is not exactly a small painting or is not something just like you know the little pointillism etc. That's not miniature. Miniature is basically um, it's an uh, the aesthetic is basically what one needs to understand right. in miniature painting. For example, um, the stylization of miniature painting, mm. uh, it's actually very spiritual, the entire process of the stylization mm. also. For but example, what does stylization mean? Yeah, for, for example, you know, um, when we look at uh, realistic art form, right? Yes. So we have these various, for example, uh, if you look at your uh, dress, mm. so there are lots of you know different curves and lots yep. of different um, forms that are forming, etc. Yeah. But in miniature painting, what we do is that we pick the essence, basically. Ah. So by picking the essence, if the movement is, for example, if this is the flow, yes. then that's the essential movement that we will capture. Oh. We will eliminate the extra contours. Right. So you um, wouldn't make every single check on this exactly. outfit, We're but going you to, would get um, the kind of drape of it. Yeah, we'll get the drape mm. of it, we'll get the texture also, but we won't follow the folds exactly, ah. but we'll follow the uh, checkered pattern to capture the essence of the checker, ah. basically. The purpose of this basically was, um, initially, let's say, hmm. was that um, they were not painting realistic, um, let's say, human beings, etc., right? So right. they were painting the archetype 
Okay. So by the archetype, I mean, for example, how God created Adam mm -hmm. as the archetype, and we are all the models, you know, yes. on Earth, right? So God created the tree, and then there is trees yeah. on Earth. So in miniature painting, it was like, um, you know, they were presenting the archetype. So right. if a king was painted, he was the archetype, you yeah. know? He was not like a common man, he was yeah. the archetype. So, you know, with so, the halo and the exactly, and everything. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so basically, um, so when they, they were eliminating all the extra contours, they were making it perfect. So how you see Ooh. in miniature painting, you don't see shadows per se. That's true, exactly. actually. So, yeah. Yeah, so the reason behind this was also, um, you know, uh, aside from the fact that there's this... Um, uh, isometric perspective What's that, that? The, uh, the isometric perspective <laughs> is sort of like a godlike view that they're giving oh, you. So, sort of so top, you see the down? top and the side, basically. Oh, so it's okay. giving you an omnipotent sort of view. Right. So yeah. <laughs> so it's all seeing, it's all really heavy. Seeing. So even yeah. so even just by the act of observation, <laughs> yeah. you are kind of inhabiting that space when yeah, you are exactly. kind of all seeing exactly. observer exactly. of exactly. the scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's placing the viewer in this very uh, godlike sort of right. view point. So, um, or vantage point, so to say. Yeah. So, um, so basically, uh, the stylization of miniature painting and even the colors that are involved within miniature paintings, if you notice, um, if you look at the previous, let's say, the very old uh, miniatures, the traditional art forms, so to mm -hmm. say, so you will notice that there's a very um, calculated sort of color composition within those paintings. Oh, okay. So that calculation is also actually very... Um, Planned. Useful and very planned, yes, yeah. and very useful for students in you know in this day and time to mm. learn from. Mm. Because mm. Um, if, for example, if you look at paintings in the mid Renaissance period, you see yes. this golden ratio in the paintings. Yes. So that is the same thing that is being followed in miniature painting oh. in the East. Also. Except that it's just like hey, not necessarily is small. Different. It's it's large also. Ah. For example, uh, if you see Imran Qureshi's paintings, yes. you know in That's this true. day and time, Absolutely. you see these huge miniatures. Mm. You see Khadim Ali. You have these huge miniatures. So um, the technique remains the same. Huh. Only the scale changes. Oh, so, uh, so a miniature yeah. isn't necessarily a tiny painting. No, 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 it's, not at all. It can be on any scale. It's exactly. just that the principles are intact. Yeah, the aesthetic is basically huh. remains constant. <laughs> so learning so much. <laughs> that today? It's such an art nerd. <laughs> So I really like the idea of the discipline and because you work with students and it's sort of like that thing because I have a writing background and it's that sense that you have to know the rules in exactly. order to break them. Yeah. So you can't just be like, ha ha, I ignore grammar. Exactly, exactly. But you can ignore grammar only when you know exactly what exactly. grammar does. Exactly. So in the same way, if you are, you know, Imran Qureshi or you're Shahzad Sikandar or, you know, Aisha Khalid, hmm. you are taking the form and then you're just going to... Or exactly. Uma, even. So that means you're not ignoring it, you're yeah. actually using it as a device. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's really fascinating. Hmm. I really, that's a wonderful idea. And I also know, Hadia, that you spent a summer in yeah. Salzburg, yeah. in Austria, <laughs> at a summer school, that's and you were working cool. with Imran Khuresh. Exactly. Hmm. And what were you doing there? Because this is like a fascinating <laughs> like summer camp, and I was like, I wish I could go. <laughs> <laughs> actually, the thing is that miniature painting, um, NCA is the only institution mm -hmm. that offers a bachelor's degree in miniature painting in the entire really? world. Really? In the yes. world? In the entire world, yes. <laughs> hey, well done, so, NCA. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so basically, the uh, Prince's School of Traditional Arts, mm -hmm. uh, they have a course in miniature painting. So basically, the Summer Academy in Salzburg decided mm -hmm. to offer this summer course, which yes. is kind of like a crash course, okay. which offers miniature painting to uh, students from all sorts of backgrounds. Oh. So for example, at NCA, you have this, you know, you have these prerequisites, etc. So yes. you have to have an art background or you have to have some certain, you know, uh, admission test that you, mm -hmm. you know, kind of pass some and then you come training. into. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That you, uh, that you, you, you know, you have this sort of admission process. Yeah. So at the summer school, there is no, um, you know, admission procedure, right. so to say. Anybody so can anybody can come in. Mm -hmm. So basically, when we went over there, so we had students of all ages. Mm -hmm. For example, we had students who were like 80 years old, you know, who were dermatologists and who were physicists and who were scientists and who were architects, etc., and who were archaeologists. So yeah. we had students from all sorts of age groups, all yeah. sorts of yeah. um, backgrounds, also, and from across the globe. So, you know, literally from across, across the world. Yeah, I, I love that. And they were coming yeah. here to sit on the floor. Exactly. And <laughs> learn how to do miniature. Yeah, and because miniature is something that, you know, it, it, it takes a lot from you. It's very demanding mm -hmm. in the sense that it takes a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, um, you know, your entire body kind of goes in sync, you know, with the work, ah, right? For example, really? if you have to make a single line, mm -hmm. so you have to practice that line, you know, various times. And, uh, you know, your breathing and everything has to be in sync. So, really? um, wow. So, when we had students from all sorts of backgrounds, so, you know, we had dermatologists who were 80 years old whose hands would shake. Ah. So, you know, it took them a while to get the hang of it, but, you know, it was something that really transformed their practice. And they were amazed at the sort of um, transformation that was resulting in their entire person also, you know, through miniature painting. So, yeah. So, from <laughs> elevating yeah, yeah. something into 
it's just incredibly complex and they love mm -hmm. how um, art from this part of the world, yeah. from South Asia, is yeah. never just art, is it? Mm -hmm. And I really mm -hmm. love the idea of uh, breath work, yeah. for example. <laughs> you know, it's such a delicate process. Exactly. And you literally have to kind of train yourself to breathe because if you breathe, too deeply what happens. Yeah, you know, like your line could just waver. Or for ah. example, if you're gilding, uh, the process ah. of applying gold leaf. Yes. So if you're gilding and if you breathe too hard, the gold would just, you know, it would fly away. So. Fly away. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> literally that. <laughs> Goodness. So, yes. Numa, you also do sculpture. Do you think that it's also, it's, it's the sort of equally kind of immersive process as the miniature or, or, or is it different? Because, you know, I don't make any art, but I'm very curious to know what happens. I think it is uh, like uh, in sculpture even there's a lot of patience mm. and sculpture is especially if you're molding and casting or like you know it go you have that whole that you know this step and this step and that uh, step uh. And when you're taking details out in sculptures like my sculptures for example are really really small yes. as opposed to my paintings that have become much larger uh. so like you so obviously the whole thing like she's saying you have to control your breathing but at certain times I have to stop breathing and kind of like, you know, try to get details out. Uh, like, yep, with gotta it, hold your breath. <laughs> yeah, like you, I can hold my breath for a very long time, especially if the stroke what? is long, you literally ah. stop and you're like, you do this. <laughs> but with uh, sculpture, I think with miniature, it's more like, uh, um, like, you know, it's more meditative, at least for mm -hmm. me. Because like, you have to first even prepare your space. Like after, because I start two, three paintings at a time, but even if I finish them, I have to wipe down my whole space, make sure that, you know, especially when you add water to your pigments mm -hmm. and I have like dark inside, I have to make sure none of the hair goes in, none of that, like, you know, no dust particles and all. So That's your tricky. area always, mm -hmm. with sculpture, for example, I can get away with a lot. Like, you know, <laughs> it falls, it's okay, just add more clay. With miniature, uh. and I remember I had the flu once and I suddenly oh. sneezed. <laughs> Pan blew up, and then I was staring at it for a while. I was like, oh "Do I God. add some? Just chuck it? What do I do?" Yeah. So in minutes, always kind of have to be, especially working with watercolor or gouache and all. Like even if it's oil paints, you can kind of layer up and cover up. Yeah, yeah. With miniature, slightly limited because of the particular medium that you're working with. So I think you have to be slightly like more careful and a little. Slightly, it and sounds like you have to be very mindful and very precise yeah. and be really sort of in sync with what you're trying to accomplish. And we're going to take a very quick break here and this fascinating conversation. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back to the coffee table. We're having a fascinating conversation about miniature art with miniaturists and other artists, Noorma Jamal and Hadia Zara. So Hadia, tell me, um, we've been talking about, um, well, we haven't actually, now we're going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, when we were talking about making uh, Vasli, uh, Noorma mentioned that it, one has to be conscious in treating the paper so that it has archival, uh, you know, that, quality to it so that you can sort of preserve it yeah. and as sort of as a as a female practitioner as a practitioner of your particular art what role does memory play in your work um memory and the subconscious are basically two very um let's say core um concepts or core concerns that my work is based upon because memory is something that um even like for example you have muscle memory or you, you yes. know you have various sorts of memories and um, a lot of things are in your memory which you do not even uh, consciously realize mm. or consciously know yeah. of, right? So memory is something that impacts uh, a lot of things. For example, motor, motor skills are also a memory, right? Yes. So, um, so in my work, basically, um, the subconscious and the memory and how the memory and subconscious are interlinked, for example, how subconscious, um, the experiences that kind of layer up in your subconscious mm -hmm. impact your conscious life. Yes. and impact your life in your present day even if you know events or you know incidents occurred when you were just a you know mere right, child right, right? right, right. so basically um, that is something that my work is based upon and uh, does that also figure in uh, your restoration work yeah because um, for example all these uh, when you're saying that miniature painting is like you know an archival sort of art form yes. also right and it's lasted over hundreds of years so mm. it's basically kind of like a record it's like yes. a register of history mm. it's a register of um, the contemporary art of that time, right? So what is contemporary to us today 
is you know these cars and motorcycles etc so mm -hmm. what was contemporary in that time were those elephants and horses mm -hmm. right so um when these various gurdwaras were burnt down uh, sadly enough yes. but um so basically i was asked to restore some of those paintings yes. over there some frescoes and some paintings mm -hmm. so, um, so you went to nankana sahib yeah i went that. to nankana sahib and some works i just brought back to lahore also right. and i worked over here and then i sent them back to nankana sahib so um so basically um the reason for doing that also was because it's something that is preserving their uh, let's say their culture not just their culture but their religion also so yes. um in miniature the um what i personally learned was that the the sort of respect that you give to your work mm. for example you know how numa talked about you know you have to uh, take care of your work and how dust cannot interact mm. with your work or mm. you know you you can't sneeze on your work etc yeah. right so basically <laughs> so the sort of respect that you give to your work that respect kind of comes back to you in that the form of that perfect sort of artwork right yeah. so basically um that is something um that was let's say the reason why i worked for the gurdwara hmm. because hmm. um it was something that had deeply hurt those persons you know yes. at the gurdwara so when i restored those paintings for them because i was trained by ustad bashir ahmed to restore paintings also hmm. so um so when i trained those paintings for them it brought back you know a whole sort of uh, let's say portion of history or you know a whole area or a whole uh, you know memory sort yeah. of back to those people you know quite right and so, you know we hmm. talked about how especially in the miniature hmm. form because of the aspect of exactly. it whoever is viewing the piece hmm. becomes kind of part of that story or yeah. that sort of it, that interaction with the exactly. piece you exactly. know it's not just there but it depends on somebody looking at it exactly and in that way hmm. that kind of act of restoration you are part of that history now. exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. because for example um in miniatures because there were some miniature paintings also in that gurdwara right mm. so miniature paintings are giving you not just a vantage point in terms of perspective but it's also you know the composition is based in such a way that um it makes your eye travel so you know ah. there's this you know whatever is the focal point your eye sort of travels around that focal mm. point mm. and you know um it takes you to all those different elements because there are hidden details in paintings also yes. so when i was working for the gurdwara also there were very the various small hidden details in the paintings yeah. which i realized easter eggs in the paintings yeah literally <laughs> <laughs> so those were very significant ah. for those uh person so to mm, say you know uh, right. and for the six who were visiting uh, the gurdwara uh, also so it's a code yeah. that if you know exactly, the code you exactly, understand exactly. what it symbolizes exactly. like if there's a pomegranate tree and you know what it symbolizes exactly. in There your you culture yeah. then you know you sort of understand exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, look at me <laughs> so you're learning quick <laughs> art student <laughs> nurma do you feel like um that is somewhat is it true of your own practice how do you feel like your practice has evolved and do you think that um you know uh, your particular kind of female experience has helped that you know um, has influenced that do you feel like your sort of your classical training has influenced that like i'm just curious about the kind of evolution of your own practice like how did you end up at sculpture the many think, questions uh, i just asked you sorry <laughs> i think with uh, the paintings like especially the imagery that for example the moguls had or the paint the miniature paintings of the past especially when it's related to a woman she's either a court dancer or she's mm. fully exposed or like yes. she's, it's very rare at least personally i have only seen i think two paintings in which the woman is the central figure mm. and even in miniature they used to have this concept that you would know who a central figure in a painting is because he would be made larger Right. And I say he again it's normally always the man or the king that's you know the central figure of the paintings. Yeah. So I think especially when I graduated and I started like you know after a while I was like okay enough is enough. I was lucky that when we had our thesis our teachers member the shibir and all they basically told us do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you guys having your thesis because you've picked up the technique you know what you have to do but now you're a visual artist and like you know if you want to do classic miniature stick to that if you want to do whatever you feel like doing yeah. like you know the world is basically so we were encouraged and then you know especially after i graduated i took that forward and like for i paint a lot of women and i think that's probably that i think that definitely has something to do with it and my yeah. women even if i'm talking about sexuality i always want them covered Hmm. because hmm. i feel like obviously you don't need to suddenly revert to the male gaze or something Absolutely. or like you know she can say a lot more even if she's covered about for yes. example what she represents and my work hmm. is about the personal bag people carry yeah 
And when I started making my sculptures, because they're very, like, they're literally this big. And from afar, they look like toys. And once mm. you come closer, they're this. And, like, you know, they're quite ugly to look at ah. because, you know, all their features are, like, you know, they're not really refined. Mm. As opposed mm. to painting, like, you know, my paintings ah. are very colorful and lovely. But then my portraits never like then they never smile or laugh, so you know mm, that something's mm. wrong. Yeah. I like symbolism means something very specific to me if it's in my sculptures or my paintings, and mm, I don't really mm. generally like that because I find it interesting that if my work is about personal baggage, that the viewer takes whatever they see mm, as mm. opposed to me saying, oh, this is this and this is that. Yeah, because, yeah. for example, if to some people is like you know they're associated to marriage or valentine's day mm. for me probably the tombstone at the back always has a rose so for yes. me i go to that head huh. so for huh. each person something different so like that's why i kind of flood my work with a lot of symbolism and i like to like you know just kind of almost challenge the viewer that okay yeah. Yeah. this is what i feel what do you think it's about i like that and i like the distinction between it being symbolic but not code and I also like the idea, and I think the miniature does this a lot, is that what you see initially is not necessarily what's actually happening. So it's sort of yeah. keeping that element of surprise. And I think a lot of contemporary Pakistani miniatures are doing that. Like, even if you go back to, like, let's say, Imran Qureshi's work, where, you know, um, the larger work, which is the most sort of widely recognized one, is it looks like splashes yeah. of blood. Yeah. And when you see it up close, it's flowers, yeah. you know? And then you're like, oh! Wow, you know, it sort of really yeah. challenges your idea of, of what your eyes are seeing as well. Yeah. And I really kind of like the idea also that Nurma just talked about is that the history of miniature doesn't really have a lot of women in um, it. I, are there practitioners? So do we know about sort of... No, actually, I think um, I would disagree a little bit about yeah. that because there um, are, uh, you know, there are. Uh, she's correct about, you know, mentioning about how, you know, um, there's a lot on males, uh, you know, male power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the gaze and, is very masculine. Yeah, mm -hmm. and basically, um, I would just like to add a little bit to that because, for example, we're all aware of the patriarchal society, and everything, of right? So basically, when uh, she's correct about depicting, you know, a larger scale for the king, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So um, they were basically depicting power or right. strength in war, in the harem, in all sorts of, you know, but areas. again, very kind of yeah. masculine ideas yeah. of power, but also. Yeah. So basically, because when the court was the patron. Mm. So basically, wh whoever the patron, you know, for example, even in the West, if the Pope is the patron, yes. they're presenting artwork, you know, accordingly. So likewise, if the king is the patron, he's obviously going to present, you know, he's going to have that sort of work yes. produced. And then you obviously have to kind of yeah. please the king but or the patron. But when <laughs> the artist kind of spread out, mm. that's when this uh, art form, you know, kind of evolved also yeah. into various different, you know, schools. And a lot of paintings based upon women, on upon, upon their practice, and upon the mother and child relationship, mm. and the Radha Krishna relationship, for example, right. etc. There's there's a lot of miniature on that also, mm. and the woman, and even just for example, um, the beautification of a woman, for example, her personal practices, right. and so for example, you see so many artists today who are working on uh, the idea of you know the pains that a woman goes through, you know, in terms of beautifying herself. So you mm. have a lot of miniature also. Which is, um, you know, recording all of that, you know. Yeah. So it's really interesting, yeah. and it's. I think it's just really fascinating to see how mm -hmm. a sort of very traditional form mm -hmm. is being really inventively used yeah. and inventively mm -hmm. kind of reinterpreted, and those principles mm -hmm. being applied to all kinds of different, you yeah. know, uh, methods. And obviously, exactly. NCA mm -hmm. is doing something quite <laughs> significant <laughs> because you have so many uh, Pakistani mm -hmm. uh, uh, miniature art and interpretations mm -hmm. of that sort of out in the world, they're doing really quite well. It's exactly, really sort exactly. of captured a global imagination. So, you know, huzzah, <laughs> well done, well done. Thank you so much, Adia, for being on the show. No, thank you, it's been thank amazing. Thank you, Nurma, for joining us. This was a fabulous conversation. I had such a great time. I've learned so much. And I'm sure that you guys have as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we will see you next time on The Coffee Table. Bye now.